Please turn with me in your Bible to Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. If you do not bring a Bible with you, Bibles are available in the seat pocket in front of you. I will be reading from the New King James Version. <clears throat> but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident in the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ, even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from self-ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love. Knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel, what then? Only in that every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice, yes, and will continue to rejoice. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for giving us this day to come together in corporate worship to glorify you. I thank you for the tremendous opportunity that you have blessed me with today. The opportunity to serve you, to serve your people, and to advance the good news of your Son, Christ Jesus. I pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit will take hold of my heart and guide me in your choice of words so that they are in line with your will, they will exalt you, and they are delivered in such a way that we all feel the pleasure and power of your presence. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Please be seated. Are you good? I'm always amazed when I listen to or read a testimony about God's sovereignty and how somebody came to know Jesus. One story that comes to mind is that of Nathan Schroer. Nathan died on November 19, 2013, after a nine-year battle with leukemia. Shortly before his death, Nathan was interviewed and described his coming to Jesus and how the dreadful disease impacted his life. Nathan opened, describing his childhood as a disappointment. His parents divorced shortly after his death. His mom remarried and then divorced a second time when he was eight, and his mother fell into addiction as his stepfather raised him. During those childhood and teenage years, Nathan did not think that God was doing great things for him. At 22, the local police department began a recruiting initiative for which Nathan applied. During his police physical, he learned of blood irregularities. Then he saw an internist and learned that his white blood cell count was low, but not to the point where he prevented him from becoming a police officer. Over the next one to two years, Nathan worked in the inner city on the police force while developing anger issues and constantly feeling run down. Nathan acknowledged that he br briefly turned to God, almost demanding that God take away the anger and fatigue he experienced. In his first interaction with God, he learned of his leukemia and God told him, everything would be okay. Nathan gave his life to Jesus and experienced God's providence over the next nine years. Nathan chose radical chemotherapy, which put the leukemia into remission. However, he required a stem cell transplant and entered the worldwide stem cell database with no match. Nathan turned to God again and learned of an unknown brother, but he could not successfully locate this brother. But then suddenly through a chance encounter, Nathan learned that his unknown brother was a perfect match for the stem cell transplant. The transplant regenerated bone marrow, causing Nathan's immune system to re recover and remain in remission for nine years while God used Nathan to advance the gospel. After the radical chemotherapy, doctors told Nathan he would never have biological children. Still, 
God put children on Nathan's heart, providing Nathan the opportunity to adopt a newborn birthed baby from a 12-year-old rape victim. Nathan and his wife did not hesitate, and just over 24 hours after the child's birth, the couple adopted the baby boy. One year later, and again a year after that, Nathan and his wife gave birth to biological daughters. God used Nathan to advance the gospel. A few years later, Nathan's leukemia returned, but after three months of treatment, the doctor encouraged Nathan to enter hospice. Nathan knew that he would die of leukemia and prayed that God would use his death in a meaningful way. Nathan's leukemia briefly went back into remission, and Nathan realized that God can do anything and bring good things in all circumstances. Nathan realized that God could exercise his incredible power for his glory. During Nathan's three bouts with leukemia, Nathan gave to his family and community. He was reunited with a long-lost brother, served sexual abuse victims through Holly's House, a non-residential child and adult victim advocacy center. He trained police officers in Moldova and Kenya and ministered as the police department's chaplain and as a church youth leader. Another man that God used mightily to advance the gospel is the Apostle Paul, the writer of the passage that we are studying this morning. Many of you know that Paul referred to himself as the Apostle to the Gentiles. Paul made three missionary journeys throughout the Roman Empire, advancing the gospel and establishing churches. The Bible does not tell us where Paul is when he writes the passage we are studying this morning. However, he is likely in Rome based on his choices of words throughout the letter. Paul did not simply go to Rome on a missionary journey. Paul's arrival to Rome involved an unusual route beginning in Jerusalem after Paul completed his three missionary journeys. While in Jerusalem, Paul had an altercation with religious leaders, was arrested, imprisoned, and according to Acts chapter 23, verse 11, received a message from Christ that he would testify in Rome. Paul's arrest is just the beginning of this story. As Paul states in verse 12 of this morning's text, the things that happened to me. Throughout Paul's missionary journeys and now his arrest and imprisonment, Paul dealt with numerous afflictions during his travels. God used Paul's trials and people's response to his trials to advance the gospel. Many here today, or perhaps watching or listening online, are dealing with trials. Some may be living with the consequences of broken relationships or struggling through substance abuse. Others may be grieving through the emotional distress and depression of a lost spouse, parent, sibling, children, or best friend. Some may be suffering under the pain or fear of a physical disease, such as heart disease, cancer, stroke, Alzheimer's, diabetes, or some other rare disease. Some may have that feeling of disappointment like Nathan Schroer during childhood, or perhaps be confused or even angry at God for allowing these afflictions to happen. The Apostle Paul may have felt the same way or asked the same questions. However, God carried Paul through his trials of beatings and imprisonments, and I am confident that he can carry you through the pain that you are feeling today. God is sovereign and uses all things to advance the gospel, including the trials we endure every day. You can be sure God will not waste our trials. He uses all things to bring the good news of Jesus to those who are in pain. The good news of Jesus offers hope and will remove the chains that bind us, providing inter eternal freedom and pain relief. Paul's letter to the church at Philippi advances the gospel and shares that God is sovereign and that our trials are not in vain. What effects do trials have on you? How do you advance or receive the gospel when in or observing these trials? This morning's passage answers those questions. Paul speaks to how God uses trials and people's reactions to trials to advance the gospel. Paul uses the statement, I want you to know. It introduces a statement of utmost importance to his writing. It is not simply a statement of status or an update to current events. Paul wants the church in Philippi to know the importance of his condition and what has happened to him. Paul tells us in the passage that his imprisonment was far from being a negative experience. Verse 12, but I want you to know, brethren, 
that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Paul is not dwelling on his circumstances. He continues to share the gospel, and in doing so, those that hear it learn that he is imprisoned for Christ and not for a crime. Verse 13, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. Paul became intimately familiar with Rome's elite guard over four years, especially while imprisoned in Rome. The guard knew that he was in prison for Jesus and not for a crime. We can find the specifics of what has happened to Paul in the book of Acts, beginning in chapter 21. Luke describes Paul worshiping in the temple during Pentecost in Jerusalem and accused of bringing Greeks into the temple. Of course, Paul did not do this, but the Jews were upset. A crowd grabbed him, drug him from the temple, and beat him. He had not been in had it not been for Roman authorities, Paul may have died from that beating. Paul was bound in chains and thrown into, G- into prison. But while in prison, he learned of a plot by the Sanhedrin, Jerusalem's religious council, to kill him. Subsequently, Roman authorities transported Paul in the middle of the night to Caesarea, where he remained in prison for the next two years. While in Caesarea, Paul appeared before two Roman governors, Felix and Festus, and King Agrippa, the king of Judea. More importantly, Paul had the opportunity to share Jesus with Felix and his wife, Drusilla, King Agrippa, and Bernice, the king's daughter. Rather than simply releasing Paul, Festus offered to hold a trial in Jerusalem. Paul declined. Using his status as a Roman citizen, and he appealed his situation to Caesar. Before Paul deported for Rome, King Agrippa acknowledged that Paul had done nothing that deserves death or imprisonment. Because of Paul's appeal to Caesar, Roman authorities put Paul aboard a ship and sent him to Rome. Paul became shipwrecked for the winter in Malta and then snake-bitten before continuing to Rome in the spring. Once Paul arrived in Rome, he remained under house arrest for another two years. During this time, he was chained around the clock to Roman palace guards and most likely wrote the letters to the churches in Ephesus Philippi, Colossus, and his friend Philemon. Indeed, the men chained to Paul for those two years heard the gospel as Paul preached and wrote his letters. Remarkably, only 30 or 35 years before Paul's time in Rome, Rome, Jesus told his disciples of the opportunities they would have and how they should react when they present themselves. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 16 to 20, Jesus speaks of persecution but reminds us that the Holy Spirit will give us the right words to be his witness. Jesus also told his disciples that they would be delivered to councils, scourged, and brought before governors and kings for his sake. Jesus spoke of what would happen to Paul. Paul knew it, and he used the opportunity to advance the gospel. However, even knowing his calling, Paul likely dealt with uncertainty related to his beatings and imprisonment. So what would, Paul, what would give Paul the comfort to endure such trials while fulfilling his calling? We well, find the answer to that in the Psalms, a psalm of trust that Paul was likely very familiar. Please turn with me to Psalm 16. <clears throat> Scholars opine that David penned this psalm while in a cave fleeing from King Saul. The opening of this psalm, verse 1, reads, Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. David tells us that we can trust God and that God is a place to seek shelter and protection. Now go down to verses 5 and 6. They read, O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. David writes that God is his foundation and that amid trying times, we must trust God and not in ourselves. Continuing to verses 7 and 8. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. 
God provides wisdom even in the darkest of times. And regardless of the outcome of trials, David remains unshaken because God remains at our right hand and will not desert us. Verses 9 through 11. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in shield, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. David shares that by maintaining praise in the Lord during trials, he keeps us focused on him while he remains at our side, enabling joy as he delivers us through the trials. God will provide comfort while we are in trials, regardless of the outcome. Jesus tells us that we will endure trials and how to speak while in those trials. And David tells us how we can endure those trials. Who could conceive such a plan of trials in Nathan Schroer's or Paul's case and provided opportunities to advance the gospel, if not God? God will use all things to advance the gospel, including using us in our affliction to reach those in need. As Americans, we currently live in a society that would not imprison us for advancing the gospel. However, suppose we consider the literal word prison or in chains metaphorically. That emblematic prison can be used with the Holy Spirit's guidance to share Jesus. We could do this with trust and protection in him, as David tells us in Psalm 16. With trust, God will be our refuge, no matter how difficult our affliction becomes. We have, have safety in a God who will protect us through those trials. Moreover, with his trust, protection, confidence, and safety in him, we can share the good news of Jesus while enduring our trials. Today's Christians can share Jesus with medical staff, friends, family, and co-workers, just like Paul did to the governors, King Agrippa, and the prison guards. Alternatively, perhaps you're with us today and you are not a believer in Jesus. Yet you have an interaction with a patient like Nathan Schroer, and he shares the gospel with you. Wouldn't you want to know why Nathan is doing that rather than simply laying on the hospital bed feeling sorry for himself? When we look at Paul and see a man treated the way he was, we would think he would be frustrated, angry, or even suicidal, but he is not. Paul is not delusional. He knows that his life may be coming to an end. Yet we do not see Paul complaining. We do not read words of discouragement. We do not see depression. Paul does not cry and moan and bring pity upon himself for being mistreated. We feel Paul's confidence and excitement uh, in his text as he shares the gospel. Paul can continue his work because he trusts in God. God gives him comfort. And Paul knows that God can use all things to advance the gospel. God can give any person comfort, strength, and confidence to do his work. When others observe those enduring trials and sharing Jesus, they too will become confident in their ability to advance the gospel. Not only was the gospel advanced among the palace guard, but other Christians throughout the Roman Empire began to speak out about what was happening to Paul. Think about this. By all accounts, Paul was not an assuming man. Some even believe he was small, frail, bald, and bowed-legged. Christians throughout the Roman Empire started to ask question of, questions about Paul's trials. Questions related to beatings, imprisonment, and almost death as they learned that Paul did not become in, imprisoned for a crime, but for Jesus. They also recognized that Paul remained joyful and committed to his cause. Seeing or hearing about this small, fragile, unassuming man go through the trials that he endured for Christ and doing it with joy created extraordinary confidence to most within the church. Christians thought that if that guy can do it in Caesar's palace, I can surely do it here in Rome, Philippi, or Ephesus. Most Christians throughout the Roman Empire began to realize that by trusting in the Lord, verse 14, they proclaimed Christ boldly, without fear, and with love and goodwill, verses 15 and 16, or 15 and 17, depending upon your translation. The first century Roman Empire was not that different than 21st century America. Christians were shunned, harassed, and mistreated. It was not easy to speak about Christ. 
but they did it because they became emboldened by Paul's circumstances and his ability to advance the gospel through trials. Although it can be challenging here in the United States to advance the gospel, it is even more difficult in many countries worldwide. Take, for instance, Muslim countries like Egypt. A 2018 article in the Christian Post shared reports from Christian leaders in Egypt that large numbers of Egyptians were coming to Christ despite church bombings and other trials that Egyptian Christians endured. In one incident in 2017, twin bombings on Palm Sunday left 45 people dead and 126 injured. An associate pastor at the Evangelical Church in Cairo stated, The mood is very good amongst Christians who are living in Egypt. Not because the situation is good or bad, that is not the reason. We have two kinds of news. Earthly news, which is very ugly, very discouraging, and I think in the West you get only the earthly news, a bombing here or there. The pastor continued, but there is heavenly news. We know what is going on spiritually. We see things that not everybody is seeing. We see things you are not hearing. We see the multitude coming to the knowledge of Christ from every background. So this brings us joy. Believers in Egypt know that attacks by the Islamic State or other extremists can happen at any time. They react by simply increasing security as best they can, and they trust in God, just as David did in Psalm 16. David Curie, president of Open Doors USA, a nonprofit organization supporting persecuted believers in more than 60 countries, referenced an April 2017 video following the bombings of Egyptian Christians enthusiastically chanting the Nicene Creed, a widely known Christian statement of belief. Curry stated that despite the pain and shock, Coptic Christians are an inspiring group that stands firm in their faith and shows the love of Jesus in the face of opposition. The Egyptian Christians have a renewed confidence in the gospel message and share that message with those in need. The writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 and 36, that when with Jesus we gain confidence and can persevere. The same writer also tells us in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 6, that the Lord is our helper and we shall not fear. What can man do to me? Likewise, Paul writes in Timothy, to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, that God gives us the power of love and sound mind and not a spirit of fear. In the Old Testament, Jeremiah writes in chapter 17, verse 7, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. And Joshua writes in chapter 1, verse 9, that God commands us to be strong and of good courage, to not be afraid and dismayed. And the Lord our God is with us wherever we go. Paul endured trials on his way to and in Rome, and Christians throughout the Roman Empire responded boldly, and they brought others to Christ. Likewise, Egyptian Christians endured trials and responded boldly, bringing Egyptians to Christ. There are no conceivable situations that prevent sharing the gospel. God is sovereign and uses trials to open doors, to get people talking, and to advance the gospel and reach those in need. Jesus endured endured trials for us. He was beaten and hung on a cross for our sins. God tells us throughout his word that we can be bold in witnessing what he endured for us and confident in what his trials will bring us in this life and eternally. Jesus tells us in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 that we received power when the Holy Spirit came upon us to be his witness locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. We will endure or observe others endure circumstances that can be used to share the gospel if we are willing to make ourselves available to the Lord and allow him to work through us to advance the gospel and reach those in need. Earlier I mentioned that most within the church shared the gospel with love and observing Paul's trials. Yet, some were selfish and shared the gospel out of rivalry. Some preached Jesus out of jealousy of Paul's popularity. Verse 14 clearly showed that Christians became confident in Christ and therefore advanced the gospel. Verse 15 does not indicate the same. Consequently, it is unclear if those advancing the gospel with envy and strife, indicated in verse 15, are Christians or not. Nevertheless, Paul is clear that their motives are not right. 
Presumably, they were Christians, because Paul makes no mention that the content of their message was inaccurate, like he does in his letter to the church in Galatia. Therefore, it is highly likely that what Paul describes in verse 15 are bad actors taking advantage of the opportunity they have with Paul imprisoned to advance themselves within the church, as written in verse 16 or 17, depending upon your translation. In other words, despite their envy, God is using that envy for good. And an accurate and pure gospel message is advanced. Western culture is wealthy and well provided for compared to the rest of the world. Also, because of the fall and the sins of the flesh, many fall into the trap of envy and rivalry. We buy people magazines to learn what the rich and famous are doing, purchasing and wearing. We want to be more like celebrities and own as much or more than others. We watch our neighbors as they buy new cars, add on to their homes, and purchase extravagant toys and gifts for their children. When we see this, we want to do the same and then more. As a people, we generally like to keep up with and even pass up the Joneses. Some may remember the Christmas light contest scene from Ron Howard's year 2000 rendition of Dr. Seuss's How the Grinch Stole Christmas. An earlier scene set the storyline that Martha May Huvier always won the contest, but Betty Lou Who was determined to win this year. The contest scene began with Martha May Huvier standing on the roof of her house, and with the press of a remote control, Martha's house lit up stunningly, exciting the crowd in Whoville. Betty Lou Who had her opportunity, hinting playfully that Martha May might just win again, but that she had a lot more lights to light up. Then she pressed the button of her remote control, lighting her house more beautifully than Martha May's. The crowd became electrified. Not to be outdone, Martha May Huvier pressed a button on her remote a second time, and a second level of lighted signs lit up above her house, further fulfilling the, the crowd. Having more to demonstrate, Betty Lou Who pushed a re remote button a second time, illuminating even more elaborate display of signs and lights above the Who's home. The crowd greatly admired the Christmas light display they saw in above the women's houses. Despite their selfish motives of winning a contest, good still came from their rivalry as the community of Whoville rejoiced. There were those in the Roman Empire who did the same thing. They were envious of Paul's popularity. And since he gained his popularity by preaching Christ, they felt that if they shared the good news of Christ while mocking Paul for his imprisonment, they too could rise within the church. Even with the ulterior motive of envy, good still came out of that situation. Like the envious women of Whoville, exciting the crowd with an incredible light display, filling a need of a more pleasing and inviting neighborhood, the envious people in the Roman Empire, by preaching Jesus, accomplished God's purpose, filling the need to advance the gospel. Despite their envy and an attempt to hurt Paul, God's sovereignty ensures the gospel is advanced. God is sovereign and uses all for his glory and purpose. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, Paul writes that God uses all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Solomon writes in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21, that a person makes plans in his heart, but God's purpose prevails. Genesis chapter 50 verse 20 tells us that people may do things for evil reasons, but God will mean it for good and to save many people. God will use all things, including envy and selfishness, to advance the gospel. Selfishness comes from a person wanting to place their interests above the interest of others. Indeed, God included this verse so that we remain mindful of our selfish tendencies to get ahead. Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but to look to the interest of others. Nevertheless, even if we do, God is sovereign and uses all for his good and his glory. Likewise, we should be cautious about judging others. Sometimes we may see those sharing the gospel and suspect motives are not pure. However, we should be cautious because we do not know their hearts. We do not know their motives. Jeremiah tells us in chapter 17, verse 9, that the heart is deceitful and de de desperately wicked, but only the Lord knows the heart. Accordingly, it is not for us to judge 
and Paul suggests that in the closing verse of this passage. Although some were gaining temporally at the opportunity to capitalize on Paul's affliction, Paul states in verse 18 that it does not matter how Christ is advanced, whether it is his trials, those who grow confidence in his trials, or those trying to capitalize on his trials, it does not matter as long as the good news of Jesus is shared and Paul was exuberant about it. Paul concedes his judgment acknowledging that all that matters is the gospel's advancement. Paul is thankful that the gospel is preached and spread throughout the Roman Empire. Paul's choice to ignore those with impure motives is reminiscent of Andrew Bonar's very own admission of envy. The Scottish preacher wrote a diary entry that, quote, This day, 20 years ago, I preached for the first time as an ordained minister. It was amazing that the Lord has spared me and used me at all. I have no reason to wonder that he used others far more than he does me. Yet envy is my hurt, and today I have been seeking grace to rejoice exceedingly over the usefulness of others, even where it casts me into the shade. Lord, take away this envy from me. Although Bonar was seeking God's grace for his envy, Bonar rejoiced that the gospel is being advanced. Pastor Randy shared the message, trusting in God when we don't understand three weeks ago. A message of a woman named Naomi who called herself bitter for the trials that she endured. Still, God used Naomi's trials in his plan to save the world. Brendan shared the message to, to die as gain several weeks before that. Paul wrote those very words in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, just three verses after the passage we are studying today. Although dying was Paul's preference, according to verses 24 and 25 in Philippians chapter 1, Paul acknowledges his calling to serve others and help them grow in their faith. Paul knew he had a mission for God, the same mission every one of us has. The great commandment and the great commission and Paul's way of loving God and neighbors were bridging Gentiles, people like you and me, to Jesus through three missionary journeys and imprisonment from Jerusalem to Rome. As Brendan stated several weeks ago, we are not to store up ourselves, but to store up for heaven. Paul did this by establishing churches throughout the Roman Empire despite the persecution he endured. Paul's motivation was to share Jesus, not where Christ had already been and understood, but where the preaching of Christ had not occurred. And Paul was thrilled that others picked up the torch and advanced the gospel despite his imprisonment. We should be too. Verse 18, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretest or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. This verse closes the entire passage well, in that there are no imaginable circumstances that God cannot use as an opportunity to advance the gospel. The Lord will use your circumstances to open doors to others to hear the good news of Jesus, and they can observe us and how we are handling those trials. God will use those who observe our trials to advance the gospel beyond our sphere of influence. And for that, we can be thankful and rejoice that God is sovereign and uses all things to advance the gospel and reach those in need. We can celebrate that God will advance the good news of Jesus and the mechanism that it is advanced does not matter. Whether through our own trials, observations of others' trials, or even out of envy, God is sovereign uses all things for good, and we can rejoice in that. Paul endured trials, and God used those trials to advance the gospel rapidly. Imagine being in chains, like Paul, and speaking to the person we are chained to about Jesus. It does not have to be physical chains. Perhaps it is a hospital bed with an opportunity to share Jesus with a nurse or doctor. Maybe we are in a dull or even stressful job with the opportunity to share Jesus with a coworker. Or perhaps we're in the home and able to share Jesus with a spouse or child. Imagine being a Christian in Egypt and allowing God to use us to lead multitudes to Christ. Or, like Christian in Baye, thrown in prison in Saudi Arabia for evangelizing. 
an article published in 2003, shortly after the, the deportation of Christian captures his story. Christian Mbaye left his home in Eastern Africa, seeking employment as a tailor in Saudi Arabia. After spending 15 years in the country, in 2003, Christian was detained for witnessing his Christian faith. While in a crowded detention cell, God provided Mbaye, Mbaye the opportunity to share his faith as prisoners awaited deportation. Mbaye estimates that he shared the gospel to as many as 600 cellmates during 20, years, 20 weeks of detainment, and 42 indicated they wanted to give their lives to Christ. Mbaye stated, I felt that Jesus Christ was with me in jail, and now I know him so much better. Everyone knew my crime was being a preacher of Christ. Christian stories like Paul's and many others regarding trials providing opportunities to advance the gospel. God will not leave us. Instead, he will comfort and use trials for those needing to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. In this morning's passage, we learned how God orchestrated Paul's journeys so that through his trials, Paul could share the gospel with governors, kings, and prison guards. We learned that when others observed Paul's trials, they gained confidence in the Lord, and the Lord gave them the confidence to advance the gospel. We learned that God used those and their self-ambition to advance the gospel. I spoke of three other examples of how God uses trials to advance the gospel. And for that, we can rejoice that the good news of Jesus Christ is advanced. People often ask, why do bad things happen to seemingly good people? In the fall, Adam and Eve chose to be God, and our Heavenly Father allowed it. He gave us the reins of our lives, the environment, disease, relationships, and dominion over the earth. We have failed in keeping the world free from illness, disaster, and hate. Most are aware of my trials over the last 15 years, ranging from challenges in the home and workplace, disease, death of friends and family, and strained relationships. All are varying examples of the chains each one of us bears every day. Nevertheless, we have a choice. We can choose to walk through those trials independently and try to be gods with pride and ego and control all situations. We could turn to idols such as alcohol, drugs, our children, or extramarital relationships. Alternatively, we could be like Paul, Nathan Schroer, or Christian Mbaye and acknowledge that Jesus is our Lord and Savior and turn to God with praise, prayer, and song when in trials. This morning, I shared real-world examples and read from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi that God does not deliver people from trials. Instead, he delivers people through trials. And along the way, Paul, Nathan, and Christian had joy when sharing Jesus. They are joyful for what Christ did for us on that cross. Christ brought eternal life that far outweighs the short-term trials that we may be experiencing at any given moment. These men shared the good news of Jesus with every person who crossed their paths, whether in the marketplace, synagogue, on mission, at a sexual assault victim center, in a hospital bed, undergoing chemotherapy, or in prison. When asked the question shortly before his death on how he would describe Jesus, Nathan responded that he is enough, he is truly enough. There are some here today, and perhaps watching or listening online, that are enduring trials. Some are dealing with trials while in the comfort of the Lord, but not allowing God to use those trials to advance the gospel. There may be others living in complete rebellion and hostility to God and have never surrendered their life to Jesus Christ. The Bible is clear. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. Jesus is the only way for the forgiveness of sin. Jesus is the only way to experience freedom in real life. Jesus is the reason Paul, Nathan, and Christian were able to endure their trials and advance the gospel. These men submitted to God. God exposed them to who they were without Jesus, and God exposed them to whom they could become with Jesus. Friends, have you been living your life and dealing with trials in your strength? We cannot endure the pain and suffering of trials or experience absolute joy in our lives so long as we try to live in our strength and wisdom. True strength and wisdom come by acknowledging that apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. Perhaps God is showing you some area in your life that you need to submit to his lordship. 
Perhaps the Lord is leading you to make some commitment today involving your relationship with him. Perhaps he is offering a chance to repent so that you may have redemption and salvation with him. Jesus told us that we will have trouble in this world, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Like Paul, Nathan, and Christian, carries, God carries me through my trials every day while exposing me to testimonies such as theirs. And for had he not, I would not be confidently, joyfully, enthusiastically in this pulpit today advancing the gospel that Jesus has overcome the world. Friends, the choice is yours. God will advance the gospel. Will you submit to him and allow him to carry you through your trials? Let us pray. <clears throat> Father God, I thank you for this gathering and this opportunity to exalt you. I thank you for reminding us through your word that you are in control of all situations. In situations such as the Apostle Paul's in Rome, the shepherd boy and eventual king of Israel, David, a police officer in Iowa, and an African tailor in Saudi Arabia, and in all of our lives. We know that you hold us now and always will in peace and comfort. Thank you for arming us with the weapons of prayer and praise. Thank you for that confidence and assurance while we endure the trials of this world. We know that we can endure our trials, these daily struggles, with courage because the battle is yours and that you have already won. Thank you for giving us that hope and that freedom through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. If you would like to know more about us, you can find us on the web at wpbcmd.org and on Facebook at White Plains Baptist Church 1978.